the city of Yathrib, known as Medina, is one of the most interesting cities in pre-Islamic Arabia, even before the coming of Islam. Of course, with the coming of Islam, Yathrib was to become Medina. And Medina has a special place in all of our hearts. Every single person of Iman loves Medina. And we love Medina because our Prophet made a special dua to Allah that every Muslim should love Medina. When the Sahaba migrated to Medina, they did not like it and they missed Mecca. And so the Prophet made a dua to Allah. Allahumma habib ilayna al-Medina. O oh Allah, cause all of us to love Medina. Kahubbina Makkata aw ashad. Like we used to love Mecca or even more than we used to love Mecca. And Allah granted the Prophet that dua. And that's why every mu'min who enters Medina feels the love of Medina. And they desire Medina. And they miss Medina because that special place exists in our heart for Medina. But what was Medina before the migration of the Prophet wasallam? It was the city of Yathrib. And the city of Yathrib had many interesting, unique characteristics. The city of Yathrib, when was it founded? We don't know for sure. But we have remnants from the time of the Babylonian inscriptions that mention the name Yathriba in 550 BC. And we also have the famous uh, geographer, the Greek geographer, Ptolemy, the most famous geographer of the Greeks. His name is Ptolemy. He wrote a, a massive geography of Ptolemy. And in it, he went over the cities of Arabia. This is hundreds of years before the, the, the coming of Jesus Christ. And in it, he has the city of Yathriba. The city of Yathrib is mentioned by the famous Ptolemy. Even Abraha, the one who came into Mecca, you know, the one of the elephants. Abraha had ventured into Arabia before the incident of the field by two, three years. He had come in and he had gone north past Mecca. And he had conquered the city of Yathrib for a little bit of time before he went back down. And it was then left, uh, you know, uh, as it was. And there's an inscription. I actually once posted it on my Facebook. There's an inscription of Abraha. The actual Abraha, one of his, you know, calligraphers wrote something in their language in Arabia that says we conquered this land and this land and this land and mention also is the land of Yathrib or the city of Yathrib. So the city of Yathrib is something that of course it was there from the beginning of time. From how long ago? Perhaps as long as 1000 BC, maybe even more than this. In other words, 3000 years ago. Yathrib has been around according to recorded history for over 3000 years. The name Yathrib, what does it mean? Most likely, it comes from the founder of the city, one of the Amalekites, the Amalika. He founded the city and it was named after him. And some say it goes back to an Arabic verb, which is highly unlikely because there was no Arabic when the, when the city was uh, founded. But we know for certain that it has been a human settlement for two to three thousand years. Now, Yathrib was unique in many ways. Today, we'll mention seven of them. Yathrib, pre-Islamic Medina, was unique in seven ways. Point number one, point number one, the location of Yathrib. Yathrib, Medina, it is close to the main highway. There were highways, pre-highway of our times, right? There were highways where camels and people would walk, the famous highways. The largest superhighway that connected Byzantine land to Yemen passed a stone's throw away from Yathrib. So Yathrib was very conveniently located, not right on the path, which would have been dangerous, armies can come, and not too far from the path, but a very reasonable distance from the path, half a day's journey. Enough that if you need to be connected to civilization, you can, and it's not too close that the armies can attack you. And that is why the Battle of Badr, for example, took place on that highway, that massive highway, because Abu Sufyan's caravan is going up there. So that city of Yathrib, as they say, location, 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 Yathrib was situated in terms of its ge geography in central Hijaz, Central Arabia. You look at the map, Mecca is way down, you know, south. It is close to the, uh, the ocean. It is close to the Red Sea. Yathrib, Medina, is up north. And it is somewhat central. And it is right next to the super highway, but not too close to that highway. So that is point number one. Point number two, it is one of the very few places of the entire Arabian Peninsula that has something very unique in geography, in geology and that is underwater rivers. 
I forgot the term, is it subaltern, sub, subaltern river, something like this. It's a ge geological term. It's a common phenomenon, not that common in Arabia. There's actual rivers that run underneath the ground, just like the rivers that run above the ground. I'm not making this up, this is true. You have rivers that run beneath the ground. Yathrib, Medina, is situated on top of multiple rivers that run underneath the ground. And this is very unique. When you have rivers that run on top of the ground, that has a lot of pros, but it also has a lot of cons. And of those cons, the water dries up easily. Of those cons, you can block and dam the river such that it doesn't reach your city. There's cons as well in the desert. If the water goes a little bit less, the river will dry up. So when you have underwater rivers, which Yathrib has, you have under, and I've seen this by the way, I visited a farm when I was a student in Medina, and you know, we, uh, the person had dug, you see the water just gushing, 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 and it's not on the top of the soil it's underneath the ground so if you tap in the right location and that's why there's wells of Medina if you tap in at the right location you go down 20 30 40 50 60 feet you will tap into that fresh water this water is rainwater coming from the mountains of Tihama or sorry not Tihama so up north and is going down towards Tihama so there's underwater rivers and it is those rivers that allowed people to settle in Yathrib as you are aware the majority of Arabia is a desert there are no rivers, there are no water. The people of Makkah, Allah blessed them with the miracle of one well, one well of Zamzam. That's why there was a small city there. As for Yathrib, it has plenty of underwater streams. And this is a blessing that Yathrib had. Thirdly, because of this, because of the underwater streams, what are you going to get? Greenery, cultivation. Yathrib was one of the only cities in the entire Arabian Peninsula, in the entire region of the Hejaz, that is based on agriculture. What other city is based on agriculture in that region? Very few. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, Yathrib was one of the only cities that is based on agriculture. You plant zira'ah, ah, you have gardens, you have massive date palms. There were a few other pockets, Khaybar and whatnot, but Yathrib is located centrally, and it is one of the only places that has agriculture. Now when you have agriculture, what comes as a result of agriculture? Civilization, permanent buildings. If you have agriculture, you're not Bedouins, which is most of Arabia. You're not wandering every day. You don't know where you're going to go. The majority of Arab tribes were Bedouin in nature. They're wandering in search of food, in search of water, in search of, of, of greenery. As for the people of Yathrib, because they were located in one area, they can build an infrastructure. They're permanent people and when you're permanent and you're not nomadic nomadic then you build a civilization your culture your thaqafa everything it raises up a level and that's why bedouins are harsher people people of the city have a little bit more you know adab and civilization that's the people of yathrib that is point number three point number four yathrib was absolutely unique because it was one of the only places that was multi-religious multi-religious Hardly any other city in Central Arabia had different faiths. But Medina or Yathrib, as we know, Mecca did not have a population of Christians or Jews. Okay? The majority of Arabian Bedouin tribes and cities, they might have had the odd Christian or the odd Jew wandering through, but to have an actual group of large people that are belonging to different faiths coexisting together, of course, Yathrib had that. You had number of tribes of the Yehud and you had a, a number of tribes of the polytheists and they were living together for centuries this was very very unique we're going to come back why all of this is useful obviously so point number four is that the diversity of the people now there were other places where there were Yehud Khaybar had Yehud but Khaybar did not have pagans did not have mushrikun it was all Yehud most of Arabia was only mushrikun Yathrib had half Yehud half Mushrikun, and they're living next to each other for centuries. And this is going to come important and key. So this is point number four. Point number five, the story of how the Yehud ended up there. Very interesting, very bizarre. Now, there's many theories here, f footnote, tangents. It's been a while since we've gone into a tangent. But how did the Yehud end up in the middle of Arabia? There's like five different theories. The theory that I believe has the most evidence and Allah knows best. It is after the destruction of the second temple during the time of Jesus Christ. You know the wailing wall that you see? That is the second temple. When that temple was destroyed and Jews were scattered once again, so groups of them went down from Jerusalem. They went down south. 
and either they settled in Yathrib or they came down to Yemen and then went back up to Yathrib, one of the two, right? So these are Jewish people from Jerusalem that are coming down after the second temple in the time of Jesus Christ and they're finding shelter. They've been expelled from Jerusalem and they work their way down. Either they stop in Yathrib or they go down to Yemen. Why Yemen? Because Yemen had some of the largest population of Jews outside of Jerusalem. Up until 1947, Iraq and Yemen had the largest concentration of Jews in the Arab world. In 1947, they all migrated, as you know. So Yemen had a large group of Jews. Either they came down, and then for whatever reason, they came back up, or they just stopped at Yathrib. This is the expulsion of the Jews in the time of Jesus Christ. They ended up in Yathrib. Point number six, the Arabs of Yathrib were totally unique. They were not Arabs of Central Arabia. They were not the Quraysh, the Hawazin, the Tihama, the Banu Kilab. They were not of the famous tribes of Central Arabia. This is really bizarre. In the middle of Central Arabia, you had Arabs who were not from Central Arabia. Where were they from? The Aus and the Khazraj were from where? Yemen. The Aus and the Khazraj were not Central Arabites. They were not from that region. They spoke a slightly different accent. They spoke a different lahja. They wrote slightly differently. They had a slightly different dialect. Their culture was different. They didn't belong to that region. They came from Yemen. Why and when did they come from Yemen? They came from Yemen perhaps 200 years before the Hijrah, 150 years before the Hijrah, when the great massive dam, the biggest dam ever built pre-modernity, in fact, in fact, some modern scholars say the dam of, it is called the, uh, the dam of Ma'rab, the, the, the Sayl al-Arim, the, the, the Allah mentions in the Quran, right? Uh, uh, Allah mentions in the Quran. What is the beginning of the verse? جَنَّتَانِ عَنْ يَمِينِ وَشِمَالِ كُلُّ مِنْ رِسْخَ بِكُمْ وَزْكُرَةً فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ سَيْلَ الْعَرِيمِ Where are all the Hufadah? There's like 50 Hufadah, nobody helps me out. What's the point of having Hufadah when you can't quote from the top of your head? فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ Sayl al-Arim. What is Sayl al-Arim, Hafiz Ab? No, it's not the dam. Sayl al-Arim is the flood that destroyed the dam. Close enough. Nice try. Sayl al-Arim is the flood of Arim. Okay? Sayl al-Arim is the flood of Arim that destroyed the dam of Ma'rab. The dam of Ma'rab is what? The queen of Sheba. Who is the queen of Sheba? Sulaiman. From that time frame, that civilization, the queen of Sheba, they built the most magnificent dam known to mankind. They say it is double the size of Hoover Dam here in America. They say double the size built 2,000 years ago. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran, because they were ungrateful, right? Because they were, had kibr. We substituted their beautiful gardens with, with uh, thorns. And we destroyed the Ma'rab Dam with the flood of Arim. Now, what, of course, the dam broke. The, the, the region flooded, over 50,000 Yemeni Arabs were forced to migrate and Allah knows how many drowned. This happened when? Around 300 CE, 350 CE, okay? So the Yemeni Arabs, and who are the Yemeni Arabs? The Yemeni Arabs had a king and a kingdom. They had civilization. They had a very different culture. Their idolatry was different than the idolatry of the Quraysh. So the Yemeni Arabs went up north and groups amongst them Settled in Yathrib. Two main tribes, Aus and Khazraj. They settled in Yathrib. So this is point number uh, six here, that the Arabs of Yathrib were disconnected from the Arabs of the region. Their culture, their paganism was a different strand, slightly different than the Qurayshi paganism. Their language was slightly different, and they had no connection to the region, unlike everybody else. And then point number seven, what makes Yathrib unique is this this interesting mix of the Arabs of Yemen and the Jewish tribes for 130 years they coexisted together and during this time they had some times of peace and they had serious times of war and in the course of 120 years civil war broke out between the Aus and the Khazraj and between the three major Jewish tribes, the Banu Nadi, the Banu Qaynuqa, and the Banu Qurayza. And I don't have time, nor are we interested at this stage, to go into all of the details of these civil wars. Suffice to say, 
120 years, three generations of wars. Within these three generations of wars, four of them are considered to be complete all-out civil wars where Yathrib was almost completely destroyed. And each one of these is worse than the last one. And if you go into the books of history, brutality, complete massacres, people promising to protect and then backstabbing. In one case, they gathered up the children of another tribe and they massacred the children like ruthless, brutal, raping, plundering raping literally and plundering very brutal and the worst of these wars and the last of them was the wars of Bu'ath which took place when the Prophet ﷺ was preaching in Mecca he is now preaching in Mecca he is calling the people to Allah and 120 years of civil wars the last of them the war of Bu'ath takes place and it is the most brutal and in it more than half the people of Yathrib are killed more than half of Yathrib killed all of the senior members of the leadership of the Aus and the Khazraj are massacred in this war. All of them except for two. From the Aus, you have Abu Amir al-Rahib who was called Abu Amir al-Fasiq. He's mentioned in the Seerah. In my Seerah lecture, I mentioned him. Then he fled away. And from the Khazraj, who was left of the Khazraj? The one leader left of the Khazraj. Who was he? Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. The one leader left from the Khazraj after the wars of Bu'ath. One from the Aus, one from the Khazraj. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, he was the only leader who refused to go to war. He tried to get peace before the war. His people didn't listen to him. They went into war. When the war finished, he emerges as the hero because he was the one preaching peace. And his maqam is lifted up until the Prophet comes and then his kibr kicks in because he thought he would be the king. So, what has all this got to do with us today? Well, 1,444 years ago, what happened? The Hijrah. We just celebrated the first day of the Hijrah a few days ago, right? You guys are following the news, right? Following the calendar. 1,444 years ago, the Hijrah happened. And that Hijrah was from Mecca to where? Yathrib. Now, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose Yathrib? I mentioned seven points. Actually, there's more than this. Lecture only allows us seven. Every one of these seven points is a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Yathrib for our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did not think of Yathrib. He did not desire Yathrib. Yathrib was not on his map. So much so that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him the land of Yathrib, there was no title on the dream. This is Yathrib. There was no subtitle. This is Yathrib. Allah showed him the date palms. And Allah said, this is where you're going to make hijrah to. But there was no subtitle. So our Prophet ﷺ started yearning and desiring. And his mind went. And he said, I began to think of Yemen. Yemen, far down south. It also had great date palms. And it had water. And it had civilization. So I began to think of Yemen. And lo and behold, it was a mini Yemen. Yathrib is a mini Yemen. Why Yemen, by the way? Because Yemen had strength. Yemen, the people of Yemen were different than the people of other regions. That's why our Prophet praised the people of Yemen. Al Hikmatu Yaman wal Imanu Yamaniya, right? He praised the people of Yemen. A people are going to come to you that the softest of heart and the best of Iman. Wisdom is Yemeni and Iman is from Yemen. He praised the people of Yemen. And Yathrib is a mini Yemen. How so? Because Aus and Khazraj are Yemen. Look at all of these points. In order to have an Islamic capital, it had better have location, and Yathrib had location. Yathrib had ideal location. If you want to build a civilization, you need water. Yathrib has water. You need to have structures. Mecca didn't have two-story houses. Yathrib did. Yathrib had civilization. Yathrib had agriculture. If you want a capital, you better have food to eat. You cannot be starving. Hence, when they were trapped for an entire month, remember in the Battle of Khandaq, they had water. They would never run out of water, but they were running out of food. But still, a month of supplies were there. Even though no trade is coming in, for one month, Yathrib can supply them. That's why you need Yathrib over there. As for multiculturalism and multi-religiosity, subhanAllah, Islam is going to be multicultural. Islam is going to be multi-religious. It's going to rule over large populations. You cannot have monochromatic societies when Islam is being revealed. The Quran is coming down. The Quran has to demonstrate how faiths live together, how different religions come together. And Yathrib demonstrated that. As for the Jews of Yathrib, can you imagine if 
the, the Prophet was in Mecca, what would we, where would we get all the stories of the Bani Israel, the stories of the previous prophets, all of the verses that take on the challenge of the Jews and Christians, that challenge the Yahud, the Bani Israel, and we benefit from, and it situates Islam in the global history. We needed the Jews of Yathrib so that the Quran can come down, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can demonstrate how this faith is connected to the previous faith traditions. As for Aws and Khazraj, Subhanallah, we don't want tribes that have connections with other tribes. We don't want tribes that are deeply rooted in the region. A new faith is coming. It's going to uproot the other people. And so Aws and Khazraj cannot have ties with the Hawazin, with the Kinda, with the Quraysh. They have to be independent as they were. Ethnically, they were different. They didn't have strong biological ties with other tribes. So when Islam comes, Islam can now take over the Aws and Khazraj and they are unique. They know they're unique and they can take a new faith. And as for the wars of Bu'ath, Aisha herself said, hadith is in Bukhari. Aisha herself says, Allah gifted the Prophet ﷺ with the wars of Bu'ath. Allah gifted the Prophet ﷺ with the wars of Bu'ath. How so? Because people were tired of the civil war. 120 years of civil war. Mass murder, mayhem, chaos, nationalism and, and, and bad religion come together. And they just hated it. And so, all of the elders are destroyed, except for one or two that we need to take on and understand what nifaq is, understand how to deal with evil people. Allah left them for that wisdom. But society couldn't have those evil leaders in the majority. So they're completely wiped out. And the new generation in their 30s, in their 20s, the new generation that is not set in the ways of the elders, and they're tired of the ways of the elders, and they're open-minded, and they want to see how can we overcome this last 120 years, and now they hear of Islam. Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, wallahi, if you look at this entire summary, and it's much more, it is as if Allah Azza wa Jal is planning 2,000 years of different things happening. The expulsion, the Sadd of Ma'arab coming down, the Jews coming here, the Aws and Khazraj doing that, the location of... Everything is being put right into place for the right time and the right location and the right incident. But see, this is how Allah's Qadr works. When Allah Azza wa Jal wants to do something, then Allah does it. We don't understand how. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُو No one can understand the armies of Allah other than Allah. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates we don't understand how and this is what we know how about what we don't know about Yathrib how about we don't know about why this city was chosen when you look at the wisdoms of why this city was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you begin to just be astounded and everything fits into place and you realize that subhanallah when Allah decides something when Allah azza wa jal says kun then indeed the fayakun happens and it happens upon the right time and place and methodology one final point I've been saying Yathrib Yathrib Yathrib, Yathrib. The reality is that we should only say Yathrib if we're talking about pre-Islamic Medina, which is what I'm doing here. We are not supposed to say Yathrib for the modern city of Medina. And I'm not you saying it for the modern city. I'm talking about the classical city. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, where is Yathrib mentioned? Where are the Hufad? Let me quiz you guys. Where are the Hufad? Where does Allah say about the Hufad? You recited in Fajr two days ago, right? Yeah. يَا أَهْلَ يَثْرِبَ لَا مُقَامَ لَكُمْ فَرْجِعُوا Right? Somebody can say, Shaykh, you're saying we shouldn't say Yathrib. Allah says Yathrib in the Quran. We respond, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying what the leaders of the hypocrites said. They called it Yathrib, they didn't call it Medina. وَإِذْ قَالَتْ طَائِفَةُ مِنْهُمْ In the battle of Ahzab, when the hypocrites said, يَا أَهْلَ يَثْرِبْ So Allah is describing what the hypocrites call Medina. We don't call it Medina. Hadith is in Sahih, we don't call it Yathrib. Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ came back from an expedition and he saw the city of Medina and he said, يَقُولُونَ يَثْرِبْ وَهِيَ الْمَدِينَ They call the city Yathrib, but it is the city of Medina. And the hadith in Musa ibn Ahmad, that the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, whoever says Yathrib, let him say Astaghfirullah. Whoever says Yathrib, let him say Astaghfirullah. Meaning if you call Medina Yathrib, we don't do that anymore as a modern city, but in that time, you should not do this. So Yathrib is only said for the historical city. As for the modern city, we do not call it, we call it Medina. And of course, there are other names of Medina. Most importantly, Tayba and Taba. 
Tayba and Taba. Our Prophet called the city Tayba and Taba. And also, the Quran calls the city. What is the city called in the Quran? Hafiz Sabs, other Hufaz. We got like 50 Hufaz here. What is the Allah called uh, the Quran? Um, Allah called Medina in the Quran? Come on. I should not even tell you. We have so many Hufaz. Walladheena tabawwa ad-dar. The abode. Allah calls Medina ad-dar, the house. It is the house, the ultimate house. This is one of the names of Medina, right? And there are other names as well found in the Quran and Sunnah. Bottom line, purpose of today's brief khatira, remind ourselves of the hijrah and remind ourselves that the plan of Allah is infinitely wise. And we can begin to just see some wisdom, some wisdoms. But when Allah wants to do something, it will be done. And whoever puts their trust in Allah, Allah's plan will come into effect. And whatever happens in our lives, it's all of these interconnected things happening, going back many generations. We don't know how and why and what, but it is all Allah's qadr. As Allah says to Musa, when he's wandering in the desert, lost with his pregnant wife, not having any food and water, and he sees the, the light here, and in the middle of the desert, he goes to that light Allah says to him ثُمَّ جِئْتَ عَلَىٰ قَدَرْ يَا مُوسَىٰ All of this chaos that you think is chaos it's not chaos O Musa you came here because it was my qadr I had said and I had decreed and it was preordained that this is what is going to happen there is no chaos in this world everything that happens happens with the qadr of Allah we put our trust in Allah we make dua to Allah for the best qadr and inshallah we'll continue later on wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما إن الذين يؤذون الله ورسوله لعنهم الله في الدنيا والآخرة وأعد لهم عذابا مهينا والذين يؤذون المؤمنين والمؤمنات بغير ما اكتسبوا فقد احتملوا بهتانا وإثما مبينا Thank uh-huh.